We continue with our discussion on Applied Corporate Finance Unit 2 and uh, we were discussing on the hurdle rates and uh, the capital asset uh, pricing model CAPM. Uh, we have already uh, covered the first part of that which is the risk-free rate. Now we are supposed to find out what is uh, what is the beta at some point of time but in this particular video we are going to look at what is the equity risk premium. Right, so we're going to look at what is going to be the risk premium that someone would demand for investing in a stock market over and above the risk free rate. So RM minus RF is what is called as the equity risk premium. This entire term is called as the equity risk premium where RM is nothing but the return of the market or expected return, expected return of the market of the equity market right remember that's the equity market and RF is the risk free rate so let's understand uh, this in a little bit more detail as to what is this this equity risk premium is the amount of extra return remember extra return and that's why we use the term RM minus RF over and above the risk free rate that you would expect for investing in equities as a general principle it has to be greater than zero because if you're getting five percent in risk-free rate there is no reason for you to get lesser than that in equities right remember equities are riskier and it's a non-zero amount of risk that you will take uh, while investing in equities uh, risk-free rate is essentially the debt rate and given that equity is riskier as compared to the debt you would want it to be a, a premium to be greater than zero also it should increase with the risk aversion of the investors in the market. So if in general people are a little bit more risk averse for whatever reason, they don't like the stock markets or they're just uh, worried about what's going to happen in the stocks in the near term. In those contexts, the, the risk aversion increases. Risk aversion is uh, going to create less likelihood in people taking those risks. Once that happens, essentially it is important that uh, that equity risk premiums also increase or the return that people demand so the return demanded for taking that risk in equities goes up when risk aversion increases right so for taking the same amount of risk I will want a bigger return and hence uh, equity risk premiums can go up now one thing we need to remember is that equity risk premiums could be dynamic and they could change from day to day it gets proven by the fact that if the market stock market has just fallen 20 percent and then you ask someone uh, you know what is the excess return that uh, that you would want for investing in equity markets this number would be higher than if the number was asked when the markets were stable so if you ask in stable markets what is going to be the equity risk premium and someone says i want a five percent extra return for investing in equities in volatile markets this number is going to increase this number is almost always going to be greater than five percent so risk premiums could change and in a way they are reflective of what is the current market condition are they stable or are they volatile right so these two go hand in hand and in extremely volatile market conditions it is logical to expect that risk premiums would go up now, how do you calculate risk premiums? There are three broad methods of calculating. Um, the first one is uh, you can use a survey. So that's called the survey method. Uh, the second one is you can calculate historical excess return. Remember the equation is RM minus RF. So you could find out what is the RM or return on the market in the last many years and subtract the historical risk free rate average from that. Uh, generated by stock markets over and above the risk free rate and assume that investors would continue to expect the same premium over the future as well that's an assumption remember what we are calculating is historical so it's backward looking and what we are assuming that investors will continue to expect it in the future as well right they are okay with the same return in the future as well the third way which is the most dynamic way is that you assume that the current market level is correct which means the market is sort of fairly valued and you back calculate the implied you back calculate the implied return based on the current cash flows that you expect from the markets as a whole 
so we will look at this in more detail but effectively you assume with the starting point as the current market value and then you look at the cash flows the entire stock market is expected to give you and you try and find out what is the implied return there so in a way you are discounting cash flows or you're doing similar to what was the NPV analysis right or what we had seen in seen in the bond valuation exercise how do you go about looking at uh, valuing the bond that's effectively what we are trying to kind of gauge here and calculate here in terms of equity risk premiums right so let's uh, let's understand the survey method first uh, if the risk free rate in india is 5% there's a question if the risk free rate today is 5% how much return would you be happy with while investing in the equity markets would you be happy with an extra 0 to 3% extra 3 to 5% 5 to 7 7 to 10 more than 10 right now if this question is posed to a class of 100 students or hundred different people their answers might vary significantly note that there is no negative number here you will never accept a return less than the risk free rate right it's always going to be positive you will always ask for a positive number depending on what your view is we could take some sort of a weighted average how many people expect it to be so let's say out of hundred 30 people expected to be here, 40 expected to be here, 20 expected to be here, and 10 here, and zero, more than 10%. You could take a weighted average of all the all the numbers that you get, and that's your uh, that's your risk premium, equity risk premium, right? Uh, it's the simplest method to be used because you're just going and asking a lot of people, but there are limitations. Now the basic approach is you typically don't go to general public, but you go to various investors, fund managers, academicians, businessmen, etc., to arrive at this number. This, however, is fraught with volatility, as all these judgments are subjective. The value depends a lot on who we ask, and how we ask, and when we ask. Right. So effectively, depending on who, when, and how, this is going to be a, a volatile number, and the number could just just resonate what market conditions are uh, which is good in a way but it could get really subjective and volatile right so effectively what we just saw on the previous slide was an example of the survey uh, method so that's the survey method not very very popularly used but it's an important method that you should be aware of then we move to the next one which is the historical returns method now remember we are calculating RM minus RF so we can go and look in the history and look at the historical average return on the market which is nothing but the CAGR compound annual growth rate over a period and then we look at what is the risk free rate and we basically find the difference between the two to get what is the equity risk premium so it will involve choosing a market index and the risk free rate and then finding the different uh, difference between them over a period of time both the steps however have an issue now which index to choose right which index to choose and uh, and what period to choose now which index to choose is still okay because you typically have a major uh, major index that is there but uh, what uh, what period to choose has massive implications here so you know the time period you have chosen can have a massive impact on even long-term equity risk premiums you know for example if you were to include a year like 2008 where all global markets fell this could be a problem now for the US markets if you take a period from 1929 to 2008 for example or 1928 to 2008 that number is 3.88 percent annual return right so on an annual basis you would make a return of 3.88 percent but if you look at just this 11 year period as this thing this number is negative now you can't have a negative number we already know that that doesn't make logical sense but if you take a short period so that's a short period if you take a short period your returns could be lower than the risk free rate in that period so you want to take a slightly longer period right even in the longer period if you end at 2007 instead of 2008 the equity risk premium changes to 4.79 percent so it's approximately 4.8 percent versus 3.9 percent and this is over a period of 80 years remember right so this one percent extra could have significant compounding uh, compounding effect 
So whether do you choose 1928 to 2007 as a period or 1928 to 2008 as a period is going to have a significant impact on what risk uh, risk premium you're going to calculate, right? Now, how do you deal with this problem? So let's uh, let's understand now solving the problem of what year to choose. You can make two broad adjustments here, right? Firstly, uh, to gauge uh, you know equity uh, equity uh, premiums risk premiums better you should look at equity markets peak to peak now what do we mean by that if you look at equity markets typically markets move in cycles right so it's like a sine wave that continues and these are the way the, if this is the average of the market that's how markets move so they create a peak then they create a trough then they create a peak then they create a trough then they create a peak and a trough right if you look at Indian markets for example in 1992 the Indian market Sensex BSE Sensex made a high of 4000 somewhere around that in 2008 beginning we made a high of about 21,000 but in 2009 we ended or we, we made a low of somewhere around 9,000 Right now, if you were to calculate the returns at the beginning of 2008 versus 2009, uh, you know that that changes things uh, things dramatically. There's a wide variance in this. Now, the trick to this is to look at either a peak to peak or a trough to trough because that gives you a broad sense of the business cycle, right? Which means that if you are starting in 1992, you should end at 2008 because Effectively your 92 would be here and 2008 would be here and probably 2009 would be the trough So either you choose the trough which is the lowest point of the cycle After 1992 and you select it from here to here and calculate the CAGR there or you look at a business peak versus a business peak and Try and compare the returns between those two because then you're looking at a like-to-like -like comparison of what kind of returns the market can give right since 1992 was a peak we should end the cycle of returns calculation at 2008 which was also a peak now this itself has two uh, issues as it comes up the first thing we realize is that you cannot look at the current value right you cannot look at a current value why is because if this is the market cycle you don't know where you are today are you here or are you here or are you somewhere in the middle so if you want to use current value what value do you compare at historically you don't know that right uh, the second issue is you do need to have a certain number of history now if you look at the US we get 4.8 as the correct number why is because 1928 was a peak 1929 was when something called as the Great Depression happened right and then stock market stumbled big time so 1928 was a peak 2008 was also a peak or 2007 end was also a peak 2008 end the markets are cracked in the US by then so ideally you should be looking at 28 to 2007 this 79 year history which gives you a 4.8 percent kind of a number on equity risk premium right that's the first adjustment that happens now the second problem that comes is that markets like India do not have too much of a history so you get some sort of a, you know the data itself could be incorrect because these are uh, emerging markets they are not mature markets and uh, because these are emerging markets and not mature markets you could have a scenario where uh, market movements could be extremely volatile and accentuated in which case you do not uh, you do not really get uh, a sense of what is the correct uh, correct value and uh, you might get a risk premium that is actually not uh, not in line with what uh, what really uh, it should be so in this case what you try to do is you take a mature market risk premium and add the risk specific to Indian equities so you take a base premium for a mature market a mature market would be in essence the developed market like let's say a US and you take the country risk premium for uh, the emerging market like India and you add it right so what we are saying is that we've already calculated this 4.8 percent now we need to add India specific risk to this 4.8 percent 
right? Now, what is this India specific risk? Where do we get this data from? Now, we have the base premium that's there and we already know that there is a bond yield spread for India. We saw that in the in the discussion that given that India's rating is BAA3, there is a spread of 2.44% for India. So that must be the India specific risk. There's just a small issue. This is the risk for investing in the debt of India. This is the risk for investing in the debt of India. We are looking at equity markets, right? So we can use the debt premium. This 2.44% is the extra risk that you would take or you would, uh, uh, this is the extra return you would demand for taking the risk of investing in the debt markets in India versus a mature country debt. The excess risk you will take to invest in the equity markets of India versus a mature market, we have to kind of arrive at that. Now, how do we do that? We scale it up. So we scale up this uh, this by a factor. And what is that factor? Typically, what do you do is you take the standard deviation of the equity market and you divide it by the standard deviation of the bond market. And you get this number sigma equity by sigma country bond, right? Now, how is this number uh, useful? So typically what happens is standard deviation of equity markets is going to be greater than standard deviation of bond markets. That's expected because bonds are like fixed income instrument, whereas equities are volatile. Cash flows could change. Business conditions could change. A lot of things could change there. So effectively, this is greater. And hence, you get a number which is uh, when you do this number, this number is basically greater than one. So you multiply the default spread which is 2.44% in India's case by a number that is greater than one and then you get the value right now the Sigma equity by Sigma debt so Sigma equity by Sigma debt you can calculate it separately but given that India's bonds don't trade you rely on some historical data this number is approximately 1.5 this number has been seen that historically this is approximately approximately 1.5 for emerging markets so effectively you have 2.4 percent which is the bond premium multiplied by sigma equity by sigma debt and this number is 1.5 so 2.4 percent into 1.5 that gives you approximately 3.6 percent this 3.6 percent is nothing but the India equity risk excess risk on investing in Indian equities now this 3.6 you add to the base premium for the mature market which is 4.8 percent and arrive at the number of 8.4 percent as the equity risk premium for India obviously to get an exactly correct calculation you need to calculate what is the Sigma of equity markets today and what is the Sigma of debt markets today Historically, this number has been around 1.5. So this this varies between 1.2 to 2 most of the times. So we'll take an average of 1.5 and probably stick that in as the number, and that gives us the data at around 8.4 percent, right? So that's the broad premise of what you can do by combining your historical method and not directly using the historical method on the emerging market like India, but combining it with some sort of a fundamental calculation using country risk spreads, which we had just seen was 2.4% when we were looking at our calculation of the risk free rate and extending that to uh, adding that to the mature market premium. First scaling it up using this ratio, standard deviation of equity markets divided by standard deviation of debt markets. Right? That's how extra risky your uh, equity markets are. So why do we use this Sigma equity by Sigma bond is because uh, Sigma equity by Sigma debt in a way Sigma equity by Sigma debt in a way tells you how risky your equity market is when compared to the debt market. Right. And remember this 2.4 is debt market. So when you multiply it with Sigma equity by Sigma debt, that kind of gives you an approximation of what is that excess risk that you are taking. Right. That's your uh, historical returns method to calculate uh, the risk premium. Remember what we have calculated is is RM minus RF. 
what we have calculated is RM minus RF. So RM can actually be calculated by adding 5% to this. We expect the Indian markets to give approximately a 13.4% return in uh, in steady course, approximately, right? That's the that's the third that's the second method. Now we move on to the third method, which is the implied equity risk premium. Right now, this method assumes that the current market valuation is correct. Right? Assume that the stock market is like a, a bond. Right? So if it is a bond, you will have a series of cash flows coming from the stock market. Right? And if you discount that by a certain rate. 1 plus r square, 1 plus r cube, 1 plus r to the power 4, you should get the present value or the price, right? Now, there are a couple of changes or nuances here. The first nuance is uh, typically you go on till infinity, right? If you go on till infinity, we will look at some stage. How do we calculate this as a terminal value? But effectively, it becomes an annuity at some stage. When it goes on till infinity, we assume a steady growth rate after let's say the fifth year or sixth year and that steady growth rate let's say the cash flow in the first year is this the next year becomes CF into 1 plus G then the year after that becomes CF into 1 plus G square and so on and so forth so that's nothing but an annuity and you can value an annuity based on uh, a certain return premise so you can value the annuity here and you can value all these data points here to value the annuity this becomes sort of a geometric progression right that's all the cash flows after this this point which we are seeing and that's an infinite geometric progression you can actually try and solve for it you will get the value of all these cash flows after this point as cf into 1 plus g upon and CF being the CF, the last year CF, so CF 4 into 1 plus G upon R minus G. This R being the rate of return. Now what we are trying to do, forget the formula for a minute, what we are trying to do, we have this because that's the current market value. We already know the price, which is the index value of the market. We can calculate what cash flows we will get and we will equate the cash flow to be equal to earnings of the of the index what rate of return solves this equation is in a way what return we are expecting from the market so we are in a way calculating the IRR of this equation the internal rate of return of this equation right we'll take a very simple calculation here and this is just to show that uh, that the implied risk premium actually works and then we can we can share the Excel file on which you can also try and play around with the number let's assume that the Sensex earnings per share expected in the next financial year is uh, is coming you know to be 1700 now look at the following table we'll come to the following table in a moment we are uh, we are looking at something like uh, uh, 1700 as the first year cash flow we're assuming that this cash flow grows by 15 percent in the next year right and becomes a certain number here then it grows by 13 percent grows by uh, 11% and so on and so forth currently the expected growth rate of Sensex earnings or all the companies in Sensex Sensex is the top 30 companies in India BSE sensitive index that is the top 30 companies the earnings growth is expected to be 15% and we're going to take a declining rate from 15 to 5 over the next few years to project the cash flows right so that's what happens you take the value of growth 15% 13 11 9 7 so over the next five years, the earnings per share in rupee terms is 1700 that kind of moves up to 2860 and beyond that uh, the terminal year value. So this is the last year cash flow that you are getting. This is the last year cash flow that you are getting. The terminal year value is nothing but CF into 1 plus G upon R minus G. If we solve, we get this equation, right? That will come as this value. We have to discount it again by six years because that value appears in this particular year and we discount by these values to find the present value. Now at the time we are speaking the Sensex is around 27,500 approximately. 
if you put in a rate of approximately 13% this value comes up to 26 nine twenty five or approximately twenty seven thousand give or take a few points here or there so we are saying that the current market value which is twenty seven thousand approximately is going to come if we are looking at this set of cash flows discounted at a rate of thirteen percent which means we are expecting a return of thirteen percent from the stock market correct that's what we are expecting that's what we are getting here so effectively what we are saying is that the return expected which is RM minus RF RM is 13% because 13% solves this equation 13% solves this equation that we saw right this solving the equation minus 5% gives me a number of close to 8% which is similar to the 8.4% we had calculated earlier correct so on average we expect that the Indian stock market should be giving somewhere in the range of 13 to 14 percent CAGR that's the expected return and based on that given that the risk free rate is 5 percent somewhere between 8 to 9 percent is what is the equity risk premium for the Indian markets right that's broadly the calculation that we do the implied equity risk premium obviously has an advantage and a disadvantage the biggest benefit is that this is dynamic and it would change the risk premium if the markets would run up or fall down correct and based on that effectively uh, the expected return kind of starts uh, moving up or down in that context uh, the drawback is that it assumes that the markets are correctly priced at all points of time and in their wisdom they have calculated the market value based on what should be the correct return from the stock markets right that's a big assumption that goes in. Uh, there's no right or wrong here these are uh, these are methods that are evolving so for all practical purposes a good idea is to probably take an average of the second and third method right the second method which is a historical number that gives you a sense of 8.4 percent as the value this also gives you around 8 to 9 percent depending on the rates you have taken depending on what kind of earnings you have taken and depending on the growth rates you are assuming that will give you a number between 8 to 9 percent take the average of this 8 to 9 percent number and 8.4 and use that as the equity risk premium also remember that some of these numbers are not 100 percent foolproof so you have to check for them time to time and then try and evaluate what is going to be the value in terms of cost of equity right so that's that's broadly what uh, are the three ways of calculating now there are some final adjustments that you would uh, you would still come up to right uh, studies show that smaller companies or smaller market capitalization stocks typically outperform big companies in the long run why is that because some small companies end up end up becoming really big over a period of time so it does seems that a whole market premium and because these smaller companies are not very mature or they are smaller companies the beta typically is not able to capture the entire company specific risk on average smaller companies should do better than larger companies that's that's been historically seen uh, but on average the beta does not completely capture this entire uh, outperformance so there probably is a is a is a need to add a small stock equity risk premium here right so you calculate the ERP equity risk premium for India and to this if the company you're evaluating is small add a small stock premium again this is not a hard and fast rule you can use this adjustment if the company is really small and you're trying to evaluate it and you don't necessarily have a let's say a price history for that company right so if, if you have evidence that says that it is not getting captured in the beta correctly and we'll talk about beta in more detail in our next session uh, then you may want to add this uh, this you can also calculate how do you calculate the small stock premium so the BSE for example has an index called the small cap index you can look at the small cap index versus the sensex performance right the BSE sensitive index 30 sensex 30 companies performance you can look at the difference between these two and arrive at what is the outperformance over a period of time that's one way to do things there's one more thing that comes in now some companies are highly dependent on global earnings now take for example Infosys 
now infosys gets uh, you know 90% of its earnings from outside india these earnings are not really calculated in, uh, in so so the average risk these earnings are not really impacted by the average risk of india so if there is a political risk in india if there is an interest rate risk in india the country risk of india is not really good and in the case of infosys the country risk of us is probably more pertinent than that of india right now a good rule of thumb in this case is to scale or weight the risk premium based on the percentage of revenue that comes from a mature market versus what comes from a non mature market let's say for example if a company derives 50% of its revenue from the us and the balance from india then equity risk premium should be 50% of the risk premium of us and 50% of the risk premium of india which is 15 to 8.4 4.8 and 50% into 8 which gives you 6.4 so if there is a company that derives half of its revenue from the international markets you would probably want that to uh, to uh, get scaled with that regard right and that is what is important when you're looking at uh, equity risk premiums for a global stock so these are some of the final adjustments that you need to do when you are uh, when you're essentially capturing equity risk premium for valuation of a firm right as we end this session, a couple of questions. Name the various methods using which you can calculate the equity risk premium. That's question one. And explain the method of historical equity risk premium for countries with limited or less trading price history, emerging markets to be precise. Thank you.